you've known Barack Obama for almost 20 years. Yes. Uh, seeing him emerge through the, the state legislature in Illinois uh, as a senator and then a, an unlikely sort of journey to the White House mm -hmm. as it was. Uh, you've got a, an interesting vantage point on that. What is it like to see somebody you know go through that process and now suddenly there he is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? Oh, you know, it is a, uh, uh, it, it, it is a fascinating process um, because I kept expecting him to change at some point along the way. At some point I thought every good person I know who's gone into politics has either become a bit discouraged um, or has been in, in other ways compromised by the political process. It's just it's a tough, tough process and he just stayed the same. He stayed comfortable in his own skin. He, seemed, he, he stayed relaxed. He stayed principled. Uh, he kept his even temperament. He understood what was coming at him and he didn't allow it to distract him. He's, he's, he's an extraordinary person and I, you know, I, mean, I remember standing in the Oval Office with him when this is February, it was right after he had started as president and he's having a normal conversation with me and I'm having trouble concentrating because we're in the Oval Office <laughs> and uh, uh, most people it, it either goes to your head or it, it, it distracts you, uh, not him. He has a, he has a very unique uh, temperament. It seems that there is a there's a long tradition of presidents sending a friend, somebody who has their ear out mm -hmm. to Australia and, yep. and other key allies as well. How important is that personal relationship? Obviously, he's now president. He's not just you know it's not Jeff and Barry anymore. Mm -hmm. I assume. So how how does that work? Yeah, I think it varies depending on the country. There are different elements that that work best in terms of a diplomatic relationship. With Australia, we have such a strong mature relationship between. Our, uh, our State Department and DFAT here, that um, you don't necessarily need as much um, inside experience in the State Department as a career officer as you would in some other countries. In, the, in, in this relationship, I think Australia prefers to have someone who has that direct access to the President can pick up the phone and call, call the President. Um, I, I think one additional advantage that the President thought about selecting me was that I understood the White House, and I knew a lot of people in the senior leadership in other parts of the cabinet, uh, simply based on the experience that I'd had working with him. And so his sense was, this would really be helpful to the relationship, is to have someone who n not only you know understands and appreciates the State Department, but really has um, tentacles throughout the White House and, and, and the administration as well as the president. In 2003, we had a government that was in step with your then administration on the war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. 2007, we elected a government that had opposed, or a politician that had opposed that. You did a year later. We've been in rough kind of sync. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of what happens if we get out of step with these sorts of things? Do, where does the alliance exist? Does it exist between Barack Obama and Kevin Rudd, John Howard and George W. Bush, or does it exist somewhere else? No, I, I, I think. One of the extraordinary things about the relationship uh, has been that over the last 70 years, we've made progress together regardless of who's in power. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got a, a liberal government and a Democrat administration or a labor government and a Republican administration. We, we find a way to, to advance on, on every issue and every dimension. And I think it's because in, in some ways it's not just about having mutual policy interests at a particular time. We have sort of broader um, uh, values that we share, and even more so, I think, just have there's a real affinity between American and Australian people, and some of that comes from the battles of World War II. Some of it comes from just having similar senses of humor and and uh, cultural touchstones. Some of it comes from all the trade that we do, uh, but some of it is just it's just a sort of a natural chemistry. I come out here and I feel at home the free trade agreement between Australia and the United States, some people say, gee, as far as free trade goes, there's a whole lot of exemptions there. Uh, you know, it's, 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 hardly, it's hardly free in the, in the strictest sense of the word. Is, is that something that needs to be worked on or, in fact, is that a recognition of, well, look, you, you've got to take care of some of your farmers, we've got to take care of some of ours, you know, we've got, we got some important Rust Belt states that yeah. still want to make things, you know, but we can, we can sort this out. Yeah, there, there's always a little bit of horse trading in free trade agreements. The great thing about our free trade agreement is that uh, relatively little horse trading and a lot of um, success. Uh, and since 2005, there's been a 57% increase in trade overall between the United States and Australia. 
um, un under the free trade agreement. And that's even during the financial crisis, global financial crisis. You'd think everyone would have uh, trade, trade drop off, and instead ours has increased over the last five years. Do you have a sense as to whether the United States is going to challenge this, this uh, sort of two-year study period into whether your beef is safe? Uh, do you see that as a, as a fair enough sort of quarantine measure, or is this in fact, you know, it's a trade restriction by another name? Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're very disappointed with the, uh, uh, the beef ban. We have been for a while, and we have had uh, very candid conversations about it, and I think those conversations are going to continue. So we'll, we'll, we'll challenge the current policy of, uh, of two years. But one of the nice things about the relationship that we have is that we have these candid, direct, practical conversations. There's no, you know, diplo speak and, you know, very elliptical conversations. We, we say, no, this, this, this isn't right. Here's why we think you're wrong. And we have a conversation about it. And generally, we're able to work these things out uh, just through, through a meeting of the minds as opposed to having to ever go to, um, uh, you know, through more formal processes. Final question, Ambassador, about America's role in this region. Uh, interesting that after being so heavily involved in the Obama campaign, I suppose Hillary Clinton's now technically your boss. Yes. Uh, well, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's she's uh, the person who controls your budget is uh, is in many ways your boss. Right. So she's she's spelled out that America's role in the Asia Pacific is is going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, a new level of engagement is. What is that going to mean? Whether it's uh, the president's upcoming trip to here in Indonesia or into the future. Um, well, uh, the, the President and Secretary Clinton have developed a terrific relationship because they both have a, a very similar vision for uh, America's role in the world. It, it begins with listening better, um, being a better partner, building stronger alliances, and ultimately having more friends than enemies. And uh, in particular, I think they both felt that Asia had been somewhat overlooked in our, in our foreign policy priorities which is a big oversight given that uh, just in the corridor that we're in right now, you have 40% of the world's population and 54% of the world's GDP. Uh, and they have made a concerted effort to not only re-engage in Asia, but re-engage in institutions and say, we're here for the long haul. Uh, and so they have a wonderful working relationship, a wonderful personal relationship as well. They get along very well, and I think that has, uh, that has strengthened that common effort. Is that a recognition as well that uh, a checking move against China was required, at least in terms of uh, sort of soft power in, the, in this region, that, uh, that that is going to be an issue to manage in the years ahead? Uh, you know, China, I, I, I see it a little bit differently. I think the United States wants a strong, uh, uh, engaged, responsible China. Uh, a, strong, a strong China, for example, helps our other allies like Australia. Australia has an excellent trade relationship with China, and that makes Australia stronger. Stronger Australia is a stronger um, uh, security partner for the United States. So we, we, we like to see China strong. Uh, we also want, like to see them engaged because uh, there's a heavy load on the United States in terms of helping um, less advantaged countries, and we're looking for other strong powers to be able to assist in those efforts. Um, I think responsibility is, uh, is, is a big element of being a world leader, and we're having very direct conversations between Beijing and D.C. about our mutual expectations for one another in terms of responsible leadership. Jeffrey Bosch, thank you very much for your time this morning. John, thank you very much.